Welcome back. Well, yes, indeed, they're talking about some of the challenges, opportunities, if you will, uh, concerning the administration of the COVID vaccine in Nigeria, and particularly uh, Kimitabs or what else is happening across the world and how it will affect our own supply and subsequent administration. We've got uh, Dr. Simon Aguali joining us this morning. He's, he's the chair. Africa COVID-19 Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative is also the CEO of Innovative Biotech in the States and Nigeria. Good morning, Dr. Aguale. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Now, Good morning and thank you for having me. Yeah, I know you talked about uh, some of the challenges you expect in terms of uh, manufacturing. Where would the country get vaccine to meet up with our targets, our demands uh, over time? And now that, uh, that when that news broke that Africa's vaccination campaign might have just been threatened following that suspension from uh, India uh, concerning AstraZeneca exports, should we worry? How serious, how concerning, what kind of challenge will this pose to our own quest here, given your position about vaccines in Africa? Well, I mean, this is uh, a, a big challenge. This is a big problem. And, and this is what we have been uh, uh, advocating for years. Uh, there's no way that uh, you can uh, meet your uh, vaccine needs if, if you don't produce them locally. Uh, historically, uh, only 1% of all vaccines that are used in Africa are manufactured in Africa. Now, you rightly said that the, uh, of course, the Indian government banned uh, uh, export of the AstraZeneca vaccine, and that's the only hope that Africa has. And the reason is because there's rising cases of uh, COVID uh, presently in India. And, and again, uh, the Indian government has to take care of their own people first before they export. Now, uh, if you look at what is currently uh, going on, uh, you find out that in the U.S., for example, uh, 92 million people have received uh, the first uh, dose. Uh, and, and, and again, three vaccines have been licensed here, and, and all these doses that are used uh, in this country are manufactured in country. Now, uh, the, about uh, 48 million people have received their second uh, dose. This is a population of 331 million people. Now, you look at the rest of the world, which is uh, 6.9 billion uh, people, only about 311 million people have received their first dose, and then uh, 120 million people have received uh, their se second dose. So indeed, it is a problem. It is sad that uh, uh, we're not even addressing the issue. There's no way. I mean, look at H1N1. Uh, it's the same story with COVID-19. Nothing has changed. What stops us from uh, 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 setting up our own uh, uh, manufacturing capabilities to produce vaccines for our people and, and for the continent. This is not rocket science. It can be done. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, later on, I'll tell you the strategies and uh, how this can be done. Uh, it's shameful. It is unfortunate that uh, you know we're still discussing uh, uh, the, these issues. Now, uh, the, the Serum Institute, for example, I mean, look at the vaccine nationalism. Uh, Indian banned, uh, temporarily banned the export of vaccines. The second vaccine that is supposed to come to Africa, which is from Novavax, which is a US-based company, they licensed the technology to uh, Serum Institute of, of India. And then uh, because the US invoked Defense Production Act, which gives the president the powers to ban importation of critical raw materials, uh, which is in force, is affecting the production of vaccines by uh, the Serum Institute of India. And as you know, the European Union will not let AstraZeneca export vaccines until uh, the, uh, the uh, pledge uh, uh, is, is met. So this is a problem. The 4 million doses that we have in Nigeria right now, my advice would be that you vaccinate only 2 million people and keep the remaining 2 million 
uh, so that uh, the people that have been vaccinated will be assured that they will get their second dose because you don't know when the next dose of vaccines will arrive in Nigeria. It creates some chaotic situation now because since we don't know when the next ones will arrive and ensuring that just two million, what about the fact that uh, I think Lagos trying to work on some other plans to get additional vaccines into the country. Is that, isn't that going to you know, help in any way? Where, where are you going to get the vaccine from? It's not about whether you want to get the vaccine or not want to get the vaccine. Where will you get the vaccines from? These are the facts. These are the realities. Even African Union and African CDC uh, has seen that this is a problem and they are convening a virtual, high-level virtual conference on the, uh, the 12th and the 13th uh, uh, April to discuss how to expand African vaccine manufacturing. This is the only solution that we have. I mean, the intention is not the, the issue, uh, wanting to get the vaccine is not the issue, but where are you going to get a vaccine from? This is the issue. You see, I mean, if... Uh, uh, U.S., uh, I mean, uh, for example, they, they, uh, by uh, May, 1st May, you know, the, the president said uh, by 1st May, anybody that wants the vaccine will get it. So we're looking at maybe July, August this year, that at least 80% of uh, the 331 million Americans will have been vaccinated. And that we ease uh, you know, some of these vaccines and then uh, supplies may improve in, in other countries. And then if that happens, now, uh, when will it get to us? Uh, the next, uh, I mean, from the release of the AstraZeneca vaccine that America had, because they have not approved it yet, so they have some stock. You can see they gave it to Mexico and, 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 and Canada. So if there are excess uh, vaccines, uh, where do you think they will go to? You know, uh, these are the questions that, that you have to ask. Then, and look at the position that the EU has uh, uh, taken. And uh, you know, based on the current vaccination schedule, it will take the uh, EU about eight, uh, 16 months to vaccinate and to reach uh, herd immunity, vaccinate at least 70 percent of our, our population. When will it get to us? The more you allow the virus to uh, circulate in the population, the more they gain, uh, uh, you know, the ability to mutate and making the current intervention even more difficult. Dr. Aguale, you know, you are saying some very interesting things now because the question that comes to mind right now is what then happens to all the conversation about uh, global equity distribution of the vaccines across various countries? What happens to that, that, uh, that coalition? The truth of the uh, matter is this is theory. All that is theory. This is practical. No nation. I mean, uh, your people will ask you questions. Your people are, people are dying. Infection is going on. And then you are telling the people you are going to export vaccine. Does it make sense to you? So these are facts. You have to look at the facts. It's not about uh, equity, all this theory that we are discussing. These are facts. I mean, no nation, no leader, have people, people are dying in that country, infection is going on, and they are telling you the people are not taken care of and they're going to export, uh, export vaccine. Does it make sense to anybody? These are facts. You have to look at the facts. It happened during the H1N1. We need to learn from that. And it's happening uh, 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 during COVID. So we need to learn from that and to know that we need to take our issues very seriously. And that is the reason why AU, you know, African Union and African CDC, is convening this conference on the 12th and 13th to discuss how to expand because they have seen, everybody has seen clearly that this is the way to go. You have to have the capability to produce these vaccines for your people, not only for this epidemic, I mean, if you look at the history of pandemics globally, you know that this is not the last pandemic we're going to face. We're going to have 
other pandemic, and we don't even know how, I mean, how long the COVID is going to be with us because there's emergence of new variants uh, today. Now, the problem that, I, I mean, that, that the world we have now is that we have emergence of variants. These variants, some of them have reduced susceptibility, I mean, uh, 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 distance to the current vaccines, and some of them have evaded these current uh, vaccines. So new vaccines have to be made targeting these variants. Now, if that is the case, the factories that are producing the vaccines against the original strains will now have to convert to be producing against the variants. You are struggling to still get the first, uh, I mean, the, 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 the first generation vaccine that is based on the original strain. When will you have the opportunity to have the second strain? So this is the problem. This is what we need to address. This is the fact. What what happens if because this is a scenario that might likely play out where those who have taken the first jab here in the country may not have the opportunity to go for the sec or to even take the second jab because it may not be available when that time you know when it's time if we don't act early and say listen okay well look let's just restrict it to two million as opposed to going ahead to the four million because chances are that. We may not act as fast as perhaps you suggested. What will happen to those categories of people? This is the problem, and this is why this program is very important. The government needs to know that the 4 million doses that we have now should be for 2 million people. Keep 2 million doses uh, so that those that have taken the first dose will have their second dose. Don't go ahead to vaccinate 4 million people because you don't know when you're going to get the second dose. It's risky to do that. Now, the, uh, uh, the, the, the facts of, of the matter is that uh, apart from the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, like I said, the Novavax licensed their technology to Serum Institute of India. Now, why is everybody going to Serum Institute of India? They are the largest vaccine manufacturers on earth. You are talking about intellectual property. Nobody, even if you take out intellectual property today, can the vaccine be produced in Africa? There's no capacity. So now Novavax, outside, apart from the AstraZeneca, licensed the technology to Serum Institute to produce for the rest of the world. Now, uh, uh, Serum Institute CEO came out to say that we will launch that vaccine in September because they have to figure out how to produce, do all the clinical trials and so on. So by September, October, that product uh, will be launched. So nobody, I mean, you have to have the capacity before anybody will license the technology to you. It's no capacity. So you don't what, have money. what would you advise, for instance, now, there may be those listening saying, look, I've taken the first jab. Now, I don't even know if I'm going to have an opportunity to get the second jab. While others will think, wait a minute, if this is the scenario, why should I even go for the first jab if I don't know if I'm going to get a second jab? What would you tell this category of people? Well, you know, uh, studies have shown that... Uh, one dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine has an uh, efficacy of uh, more than 70%, you know. So, uh, but that is not to encourage people to take only one dose because based on clinical trials and based on the, the protocol that the company has, you have to take second dose because if you take the second dose, it increases the efficacy to about 80 something percent. So this thing has to do with the government policy. Because if you know, and the company that produced the vaccine is telling you that you need two doses, keep the remaining two doses, vaccinate two million people, so that these two million people will be assured that they will get their second dose. So, I mean, there's a challenge here for me, and I'm, I'm hoping that for those listening, especially those who have gotten the first jab or those who are meant to get it today, they don't uh, get alarmed and, and you know, start panicking. So, uh, 
I, from what I've heard, the first dose uh, or the second dose should be taken about three months after the first dose. So if we're in, uh, let's say, April, 12 weeks, yes. 12 weeks. so if 12 we're in weeks. April, that's uh, yes, yes. April, May, June. So I'm thinking June. And, yes. you know, listening to India saying that well, we have supplied way more vaccines that we have even vaccinated our people. Imagine supplying uh, about 60 million and vaccinating just 50 million of their people. So it sounded like uh, we need to at least measure up. So this sounded like a temporary measure, not a permanent measure. And for some, they say if the first dose or the first jab gives you 76%, the second jab just about 80. Isn't that fair enough? So the challenge here is not to maybe get people alarmed. Don't you think it's fair to at least vaccinate 2% 2, 2 of our population with the 4 million doses as opposed to just vaccinating 1% of our population with 2 million and then they get the second uh, job. I believe you understand what I'm saying. If we're saying the more the merrier, we're trying to reach herd immunity, isn't it better to get 2% at least to get the first jab and get 76% protection as opposed to just 1%? Nobody is going to encourage you to do that because science is based on data. You know, uh, of course, I mean, uh, based on, it was even based on data that uh, we came up with the uh, 12 uh, weeks uh, uh, scenario. So uh, it's possible that one dose, this is why we need to encourage our universities and research institutes uh, to do research because uh, we have these products uh, in the country uh, if, if we have data to back what you have said, then we'll go ahead and implement it. But uh, this is not theory. I mean, uh, you, we can't sit down here and predict, you know, and assume that this is what is going to happen. You have to do this research and then let science dictate, uh, you know, the uh, protocol that, that uh, we adopt. What you said, fantastic. I mean, great uh, ideas, and it has to be backed by science. You know, you, I think the CBN has allocated some funds for some researchers uh, to ensure that, yes, we get in that way of ensuring that we develop capacity here. You were going to talk about how to do that. Please go ahead on that. Well, I mean, the, the, the CBN uh, thing, the people they gave the grants to, uh, initial grants to, uh, the topics of their projects uh, were not published, so I don't even know... Uh, you know, uh, what they set out to address. Uh, the, the truth is that there is currently there's no vaccine uh, development manufacturing program uh, in country. So what uh, we have decided to do, uh, living in the two worlds, uh, is to come up with a strategy of bringing international vaccine manufacturing expertise to Nigeria and in, in, in Africa. And what is the strategy? You tap from the resources uh, that are here uh, in the US, uh, do all the R&D, uh, do the process scale up, and then build a, f a facility uh, you know, down there in, in Nigeria, and then uh, make uh, initial doses of the vaccines here in the US for uh, clinical trials and then uh, for uh, implementation. So that is uh, the fastest uh, strategy that uh, is going to work uh, because you don't have the capacity uh, there right now to produce the vaccine, develop the vaccine. So we take advantage of what we have. So right now, uh, the issue that we will have is the second generation vaccine because all the vaccines that we have now are based on first generation vaccines. Uh, and there's no guarantee that they will protect against the new variants. So already uh, we, have, we are working on the South African strain and then the Brazilian strain, the UK strain. So you have a multivalent vaccine uh, that will protect against all the variants. So this work is ongoing. Uh, big news uh, probably in June, uh, you, you hear the outcome of, of that uh, data. Initial doses are going to be make, uh, made uh, here. And then uh, while you know, the doses are going to be made by contract manufacturers here, we'll be busy uh, developing infrastructure in Nigeria to produce that vaccine so that it will be self-sufficient, not only self-sufficient, but with the best products. 
uh, you know, uh, 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 globally. So that, that is where we're going. And all we need is the government support, creating the necessary environment, engage us, we discuss, and then we solve this problem. <laughs> Uh, doctor, I'm just hoping there will not be an order at that time uh, halting export of that vaccine because, I mean, things change, right? Uh, but earlier on in this conversation, you said that, you know, Africa only produces 1% of the vaccine it uses on the continent. So that's to say, at least there's some capacity, even if it's 1%. So which countries are uh, positioned, really, uh, to at least lead in vaccine production? Good question. Well, I mean, uh, we have made it clear that the program that we have here in the U.S. is Africa-centric. So uh, you won't have those issues that, that, that you raise. It's Africa-centric. That's the goal. Now, the 1% uh, is coming from Senegal. Senegal is the only country on the continent that has end-to-end. -end. That means they produce the antigen, that's yellow fever vaccine, and then they do the fill and finish. So uh, the capacity that they have now is not even enough to meet WHO uh, 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 demand because they are producing just about 7 million doses of uh, yellow fever vaccine per annum. They are building a new factory that will produce 15 million doses of the vaccine per annum, and all that will be yellow fever. So we're not talking about other vaccines. I mean, 15 million is a drop in the ocean. In fact, you can't even take care of uh, uh, Senegal uh, with, with that dose. The second company is uh, uh, BioVac in South Africa. Now, BioVac uh, capacity is for fill and finish. So they partner with Sanofi, other companies, to do fill and finish, the capacity that they have right now is just 25 million uh, doses of vaccine per annum. Even if they stop what they are doing to do fill and finish for COVID, all that we produce will be 25 million doses of the vaccine per annum. Uh, you have uh, 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 Pasho Institute in Tunisia uh, that is producing only 100,000 doses of the DTB based uh, vaccines. And then you have Vaxera in Egypt, which is producing only about 100,000. That's the capacity that you have. That's the only capacity you have in Africa, which is a drop in the ocean. And that is why the African Union, African CDC have seen the need. We need to expand this. There's no way because you have your money now, you can't even get the product. So what is the solution? Why can't we build this capacity locally? And at the end of the day, it's the companies, the individual companies that will make this happen. So Nigeria is in the best position because you have the best scientists in, in, on, on the continent that will make this happen. All you need to do is to engage with this and then lead uh, you know, uh, Africa in this uh, effort. And then we can now bring in the, this needed uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge base right, uh, to the country. Okay, Dr. Bale, um, it, it's a little disconcerting what you said when, uh, about our capacity in Africa. A little more troubling, perhaps, because, I mean, going back in time, we find out that Nigeria had tremendous capacity to, provide, to produce vaccines over the years. And this, you know, if, if the institutions and infrastructure were strong enough to sustain that had been sustained over time, they would, not, would be a no-brainer, one would, one would suspect. However, uh, just recently, the chairman of the PTF COVID-19 in Nigeria announced that Nigeria has provided, has produced two uh, vaccines for COVID-19 awaiting uh, trial and certification. Is, there, is that any comfort in the argument you were making about uh, Nigeria producing vaccines locally? Oh, you know, I, I got uh, all kinds of emails and, and messages uh, regarding that. Uh, when this uh, announcement was made, uh, uh, they, they did not publish the, the names and, and the institutions where these things uh, were done. Uh, vaccine development manufacturing is not rocket science, but it's not a trivial uh, issue. Currently, 
there's no capacity. I can tell you, uh, you know, with um, all confidence that there's no capacity right now in the country uh, to produce, uh, develop and, and produce vaccines. These are not things that you just wake up overnight and, and you want to do. And, and, and you know, we, we have to be careful the kind of information that we send because we come a laughing stock uh, globally. Uh, you know, uh, the, when you say, you know, uh, vaccines are developed uh, in, in, in Nigeria, the world knows how vaccines are developed and the infrastructure you need to develop uh, vaccines. You know, so uh, where are the vaccines? Where are the just, institutions? Just, just, just one second, uh, Dr. Aguale. When you say we do not have capacity, could you please explain what you mean? Because I would assume that we have the personnel. So, and I would assume that we have the brains, at least you are a Nigerian as well. So clearly one can say the, 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 the mental capacity, the scientific capacity is there. So what is the shot for? This is the thing. I mean, why am I here in the U.S. working on COVID vaccine? Because there's no capacity in country to do that. I mean, uh, uh, what, what, what is the capacity? For, what, what, what does it entail to develop a vaccine? The first is you have to have uh, a standard tissue culture laboratory with 24-hour power. That's first. When you make the vaccine, you have to test it in animal. And this animal facility has to be according to what we call good laboratory practices. There's no single animal facility in Nigeria that is operating according to good laboratory practices. So when you finish the animal studies, you have to produce the initial dose for human trials. And that has to be done according to good manufacturing practices. There is no single factory in Nigeria that is producing vaccine according to good manufacturing practices. Now, before you even manufacture that, you have to talk about doing clinical trials under good clinical practices. There is no platform in the country right now that does clinical trials according to good clinical practices uh, standard. This is basically what we're talking about. So this facility, this infrastructure, this uh, 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 whole thing has to be built. And it's not rocket science, it can be done. All we need is to engage, discuss, how can we make this happen? You have the Nigeria Medical uh, Research Institute, you have the National Institute for, for School Research, you have some universities. So this can be done, but currently, None of these uh, uh, things exist. So you cannot make a vaccine in Nigeria and say uh, you have made this uh, vaccine, uh, let the world accept it. No, it cannot be done. That's why we are here using the standard to produce this. And then we do backward integration, <laughs> you know, so that we take that. That's why I said that bringing international vaccine manufacturing expertise uh, in Nigeria. This vaccine, whatever you produce in Nigeria, it's not only for Nigerians. It's going to be used throughout Africa and throughout the world. So you have to abide by all the necessary standards, global standards that are, being, uh, that are in place. Okay, doctor, let me see if I can lump this last question together because, I mean, seeing the things you reeled out, standard tissue culture laboratory with 24-hour power supply, and that list goes on and on. I mean, that's going to be a big deal. But uh, so as we wind down, how much funds would we need uh, to put in place if we want to achieve this? And now the time factor, how long uh, would it take to at least get some measure of, you know, capacity put in place? And who should take the lead? That's three questions I know, but let's see if we can lump them together. Good question. Private sector has to take the lead. That's why we're here. By private, uh, uh, so the, if you look at all the vaccines, I mean, the companies that are producing COVID vaccines, they're all private uh, uh, initiative. But the government has to provide the enabling environment uh, for, for this uh, uh, to be achieved. Now, for you to set up uh, uh, an end-to-end -end facility to produce at least 200, 300, 400 million doses of vaccine per annum, you are talking about 50, 60 million, do, I mean, million dollars uh, uh, to make that uh, happen, you know, which is just a drop in the ocean based on the impact of 
the COVID. So uh, Kakovic, CBN, they can create, uh, uh, you know, uh, initiative uh, or platform or some kind of uh, soft funding arrangement, which is done globally. I mean, the reason you have the COVID vaccine that we're talking about now, a record time, this is the first time that you are developing vaccine in less than one year. Previously, it takes about 10, 15 years to develop a vaccine. Why? Because there was serious government intervention. Government intervened, intervened in the big companies, giving companies grants, you know, advanced purchase commitment, all kinds of uh, uh, gymnastics to make sure that these vaccines are made. This is what I expect from the Nigerian government. Uh, uh, the uh, African Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative is the place to go. They tell you who is doing what on the continent. And then the uh, Nigerian government need to engage with the uh, right partners in the country and bring them on board and say, okay, what do you need? How can we make this happen? You go out of your way to make this thing happen. You can't sit down and, and expect a miracle to happen. If that is the case, we don't have had the COVID vaccine today. What about the, the time government... frame? The time yeah, frame, when is the shortest possible okay. time? Now, the, the, the reason that it will take us just about 18 months to get to the destination is because we have been in this game for years. If you want to start today, it will take you about at least four years, five years uh, to set up a factory. But we have developed all the processes that are needed. We have the candidate vaccines, not only COVID, we have candidate vaccines for Ebola, HIV, and so on. So uh, we, uh, in, we, if we have all the support that, that we need in 18 months, sometimes next year, uh, we will domesticate uh, you know, uh, the expertise for producing vaccines, in, and not just vaccines, but uh, state-of-the-art latest technology vaccines in Nigeria for Africa. All right, then, Dr. Uh, Simon Aguale, Chair, Africa COVID-19 Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Thank you. Sad faces, tearful eyes, mournful moments. This is the mood of families whose loved ones are among 39 students abducted over two weeks ago. They are fellows. It's a sorrowful moment, especially for the Shamakis, whose father, 61-year-old Ibrahim Shamaki, died of cardiac arrest 15 days after his first daughter, Fatima, was abducted by the gunmen. They caused hypertension to him which led to his death. We will never forgive them. The situation is the same in all the homes we visited as parents, one after the other, share their feelings with us. We are here, our children are there. Nothing. Nothing to do. We cannot help them. Our leaders are not doing anything. They are fellows. When we hear say, the kidnapper, Need half of billion. Hmm. That day, now push. I begin push that very day. We set out to dig for the truth about what happened the night of March 11, 2021. Zachary Mogauri, a higher national diploma HND2 student of Agri Farm Power Engineering Department of the college, is one of those who witnessed the attack. 11:15. Thursday night, they just enter, start telling us that we should come out, come out. Our guy wants to see us. Which our guy again? We now see men with arms. They are all holding guns. More than 40 of them. Half of them are wearing soldiers and half of them are wearing black shirt. He tells us how he managed to escape from the attackers. I ran out of the guest hostel and I hit one of the bandits on his chest. He fell down. Before he stood on his feet, I've already gone far, and it's dark. He now shot me twice. And God so kind, the bullet missed me. That was when the school knew that something is going wrong. Another student, Bala Aminu, gives us his own version. A guy was shouting, you guys should run the kidnappers in the college. You guys should run kidnappers in the college. I was like, a kind of, taking it as a kind of joke. You know, guys sometimes do things like that. So not until I saw the guy coming, struggling with himself, I saw him in blood, bleeding. At the Federal College of Forestry Mechanization, Afaka, we visit the female hostel where 23 female students were said to have been abducted. 
It's now under lock and key. But I just sent it is another hostel opened, but deserted. Next is the male hostel. It's locked, but through the window, we're able to see property left behind by the students. 16 male students had been abducted from here. From the hostel, we're led to see how the attackers invaded the school. It's a walk through a thick forest situated behind the male hostel. The bandits who came couldn't make their way into the school because of the perimeter fence. So they took time to bore a hole on the perimeter fence. How long it took them, nobody can tell. But one thing is certain, that the 39 students who were abducted from the college were taken through this hole one after the other. Friday, 26 March 2021, representatives of the affected parents meet with government officials on the invitation of the state government. The meeting holds behind closed doors. After two hours, the meeting ends, but the looks and the faces of the parents doesn't seem like there was a positive outcome. We met the government and we uh, submitted our appeal to them. Uh, that is all what we did to them, uh, but I can assure you uh, we still have no hope. Now a ghost of itself, the Federal College of Forestry and Mechanization of FACA is at the verge of losing its students who no longer find the school safe to continue their academic pursuits. It's been 17 days since 39 students of the Federal College of Forestry and Mechanization of FACA were abducted, but there seems not to be rescue in sight. However, it does appear there might be some moves behind the scene. Anyway, I shall return here, hopefully, when the good news of the rescue of the students breaks. Emperor Simon, Channel's Television News. Yes, indeed, we're all waiting to get that news when they all return, so that at least those parents and the entire country can have something to lift their spirits. Well, this morning, as you may have seen in that welcoming slide, we've got two gentlemen joining us to uh, weigh in on the development in the country. Uh, Fouad Oki is an APC stakeholder joining us from our studios in Abuja. And then in Lagos, Dr. Donyo Kukwe, former senior special assistant to the president on media and public affairs. Uh, and by the way, he's a medical doctor. He's in politics, so who knows? We might have been using his expertise in COVID now, but... Uh, is in politics. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning. Let me start with you, Mr. Oki. Um, I haven't seen what is playing out. Well, clearly, uh, a lot needs to be done. And many look to the leadership of the ruling party to get the country out of, at least for those who have it, who feel hard done by. And there's always this impression that uh, at the moment, they just can't place your finger on getting it all right. What is going on? It is quite unfortunate that uh, we have found ourselves in this, uh, what I call, you know, a, a quagmire. It is a multifaceted issue. And the uh, truth be told that uh, the government is doing some things, but uh, it's not enough. Having said that, we must also agree that the issue of security, it's also not just about the government, it is also about the people. The 21st century security threats and security management, it's a multifaceted issue which requires a lot of intelligence. Intelligence can only be gotten from within, from the community, from the people. We talk about bandits, we talk about uh, uh, Boko Haram, we talk about ISIS. We must also understand that they are not spirits, that they have people from within. And until we begin to look at it as an issue that is affecting us and it's not us and them syndrome, where we see something as, oh, it's government, it's not us, 
then we'll begin to, to, to seriously address the issue. Secondly, we must also agree that part of the problem we have is good governance, lack of opportunities. And I think this government is, is trying you know, its best to take out us of this uh, very, very pathetic situation in which we found ourselves. There are several things to it. The global economy is affecting us. You know, a monolithic economy, it's what, it's more than anything, you know, besetting our future growth. So government truly need to look, you know, at all of this. What we should not be talking just about the federal government. We should also be asking the states, what are you doing? They are not doing enough, in my opinion. We have the local government that is comatose. The question is, is it the federal government or the state government that is not allowing growth, that is not allowing local economic you know, activities and stimulus that will help the average Nigerian, particularly those who live you know, at the poverty level or below poverty level. This should not ordinarily, against the background that we are operating a federal system, this should not be the federal government's issue alone. It should be you know, problems that, that should be thoroughly more at the municipal level. Oh, we also need to start holding people accountable. So if we're talking about security challenge and what have you, we must look at this. What is government doing that it's not supposed to do? What is government not doing? Is there a trust between the government and its citizenry? And I yes, think these are the things we, we need to do. Yes, there is need to do a lot more. Okay. We are not doing enough, but it's not as if this government is not doing anything. All right, uh, Dr. Kukwe, what's your reading of what's playing out? Well, um, I really have a non-partisan view of all these issues. These security matters are bedeviling the country to such an extent that it's almost stifling life out of everybody. So it's everybody's concern. But my attitude, I mean, my opinion is that our approach, like my brother over there just said, our approach to it is a cake. I mean, you know, to go to a school, I just want to give an example. To go to a school and carry away 300 children will require a minimum of 20, 30 kidnappers at a time. All right? And you can imagine the logistics of their movement, the logistics of their movement, the time it takes for them to gather the children, put them in some sort of you know, contraption, and move them away. It's, it's not less than an hour or two hours. And then they move along paths until they get to, to their destination. Excuse me. You know, is it impossible for us to actually stop this process somewhere? It is, it is not impossible. And I want to give you an example. I um, mean, not example. Suggestions, uh, uh, Chamberlain. Yeah. Look, when we were in government and there was a crisis in Burma, there was, uh, you know, Boko Haram attacked a, a village called, I think it's Burma, and burnt out the houses, you know. Several districts were burnt, you know, and there was argument between us and some foreign nations and all that and all that. You know, we got satellite uh, pictures of, of Burma, and I was able to count the number of houses in every unit that were burnt and the number that were not burnt. I mean, if things can be that close, you know, there are satellites, you know, there are, there are commercial satellites now that are available that can picture anything that is, you know, that has the minimum width of 12 inches. A man has more than 12 inches in width. So what I'm saying is that from, from, from a room in Abuja, you can monitor a forest in Zamfara and know every boat and see everybody that is moving or anything that is moving that is more than 12 inches. So, you know, look, we just have to deploy money and technology. And, you know, there is no excuse whatsoever. It's not a political matter. It, you know, the purpose of government and governance is to secure people, and that should take priority. This attempt of 
uh, backslapping uh, uh, terrorists, bandits, and negotiating with them, giving them money, you know, in exchange, it's not going to work. Because, you know, when, when some people collect uh, 500 million today and they, they, they go away, other people will say, okay, fine. So how did these guys do it? So they will do their own. But we can stop them. But, you know, I've not seen enough seriousness, you know, in any arrangement that we're making that can stop them. We can use satellite imaging. We can use drones. You know, and even, let me tell you, there's no state among these affected states, really, like Kano, Kaduna, Katsina, uh, Zamfara, you know, that has any credible security uh, 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 group. I think, you know, by now, like, like the other gentleman said, there are some people must be accountable. If I were president today, I will appoint, you know, a commissioner, I mean, I mean, somebody at the level of a commissioner of police, and I appoint a lieutenant in, in the army or somebody of that, of that level, you know, maybe a lieutenant colonel or something, and, you know, police, I mean, police, other security agencies, they will form the core team of a security uh, 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 committee for, uh, for, for the state. And they will be responsible. If kidnapping, you know, you, can, you may not be able to stop kidnapping because you cannot cover all the schools at the time. But you, if you kidnap children, you have, you've got nowhere to take them to. Because in less than 20, 30 minutes, forces will arrive, at least encircle the, encircle the place, and, you know, stop this action. You know, look, banditry kidnapping can only succeed as long as it continues to be profitable and there's no, there are no consequences. No bandit, no kidnapper wants to die or want to be caught. But the, you know, the more they can get away with it, the more we will get more people investing in it. Two major issues you have raised, Doctor. You, you talked yeah. about uh, satellite imaging, for example, and you said this is just a suggestion. So if those things were available over six years ago in the you know, previous, previous administration, and uh, is that to say that they are not available now, or they are not in use. What exactly? My brother, we are not. We are just not engaging. It's, it's not that they were available six years ago. They've always been available. You know, look. You know, there are satellites. There are free uh, and free satellites, commercial satellites that go across Nigeria, maybe once or twice in a day. There are many of them. Even we even have our own concept. Only that what it is designed to do may be slightly different from what we are requesting. And I also know that if we put some more money into the concert, you know, we can adjust it for this particular purpose. I am saying that, look, you, in, you know, either it's Ambisa Forest, it is Amphara Forest, it doesn't mean nothing. You will pinpoint human movements, especially if there are more than one or two people. You can see people moving and you can stop them on their track. Also, what do you do? Get, you know, get, I mean, get helicopters. Get surveillance helicopters. Get attack helicopters. Surveillance helicopters do not fly. They don't need to fly low. They fly very high, but they can take pictures of everything on the ground. So, you know, look, this, what we're doing is wrong. You know, nobody, everybody sleeps with one eye closed. And we're embarrassed on a daily basis, you know. I and mean, when I, whenever I see, you know, I even saw a state governor who did hosting, hosting and feasting grandees in the state, in state, state house. Excuse me. What is going on? You know, even some of us now, banditry may even be a better, a better job than, the, than, than what we're doing currently. We're wasting our time. If we, you know, just go on a, on a parade in you know, you know, two hours and, you know, you seize about 200 children and you collect 800 million for that. It's enough for a lifetime. So we, we, we've got to, and there are, you know, you, we don't need, you know, the military yet, we don't need all this archaic, you know, archaic yeah, defensive and security methods. Look, I, I told you from Abuja, you see, the, and I'm telling you, the capacity is available. When I was in government, I was in the DSS office, and I'm telling you, the DSS director told me for a fact that if you are living in Asokoro and you leave your window open, they will get into your bedroom. And they showed me. I saw it. And I also saw a man that left the sixth floor, the sixth floor of uh, uh, Hilton, Hilton Hotel, got into a car hire and got to the airport, we, you know, and then, you know, by the time he was boarding, we could still see him. This is not, it's not new. We have the capacity and they're not too expensive. It can be done. We're just sleeping. 
We are just, we can stop this in his chart. Right. In six months, all this can be a thing of the past. I'm not talking about insurgency. Okay. I'm talking about kidnapping, banditry. It can be stopped. Let's bring in Mr. Oki on this matter. Well, uh, in light of what uh, Dr. Kukwe has just said, I mean, the president has been to the highest position militarily, so these things, he should know all these things. So one then wonders, what is the missing link? Why are things not happening? Because if we do have the capacity, why then is it not being deployed? Thank you, Chamberlain. I don't want to dwell, <clears throat> you know, uh, in any blame game. I must seem to be talking about the Fourth Republic foundational era. Unfortunately, he missed the point. He missed the point because he was part of those who refused to properly, you know, put up a strong foundation. Because he, he, he's talking about, you know, where we were when they were in government. And he's alluding that to where we are today. I, I don't think the issue is about, you know, we are not doing this, uh, the DSS office, we have this, we have that. I think the issue at this point in Nigeria is we've all seen the issue. We've seen the challenges. Let us prefer solutions. In preferring solutions, we must situate it properly at the doorstep of government as well as the people. We need to look at the issue of governance. And really, that is where our problem is. The, 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 the talk about we have the capacity, we have this, fine. If we have the capacity, I'm sure technology will not deploy itself. Some people must deploy these technologies, which is alluded to. So we need to ask ourselves very clearly, are we truly ready to secure ourselves? If we do, we must also ask ourselves another question. Are we willing to be our brother's keepers in terms of giving out information which will culminate into intel? Because if, if we don't do it, my brother, we will just be moving in a cycles. No, but Mr. Okay, a, a, a number of things, clearly. a number of you things see? come up uh, in, from what you're saying. Yeah. Now, when you say yeah, government I, 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 and I, I, the people, I, I, I will get to that. Okay, but if I could just put in I'll this get point, to that. yeah, but but you know when because government can do certain things if and when they want. Uh, for instance, uh, government, yeah, tax went from five percent to seven point five percent. Government is going on with a few subsidy, little or no input from the people. And now about security, government can get information from people. There are those who think you can't put something on nothing. If you don't generate that trust for people to come up with information, how do you get it? If they don't trust the people they are giving information I, I, to. I alluded to that in my I alluded to that in my opening. That we must get something very clear. If we're looking at the issue of security. We must first look at the issue of prosperity. The Bible says that the idle hand becomes the devil's workshop. So we must all come together to address the issue of prosperity. And I'm talking about the issue of employment, employability, the so-called empowerment which comes to nothing the issue of good governance. Where are the opportunities? Are there opportunities? What are the policies of government? It's not just about the federal government. It's not about political parties or playing politics. It's about governance. What are the roles of subnational governments? What are the roles of municipal governments? It's about profligacy. You know, some people will call, call it, you know, what, what are the cost or what is the cost of governance? Is it, is, it, is it adequate? Is it superfluous? We need to address all of this. So it's not just looking at the technical issue 
or the issue on the field which has to do with the armed forces, it is holistic. You talk about 12. Somebody woke up one day and he said 12 was going to be 212 with no explanation whatsoever. So I, I'm not here, you know, wanting to talk about either it's APC or PDP or this or that, about Nigeria and Nigerian suffering. And we must speak truth to power. I expect Egmont to come out to say, this is where we have found ourselves. These are the issues in practical terms. It's not about, you know, we have this, we have that from your house. You can look at this from, no. It's about what the problems are. What, what got us to where we are? For crying out loud, what got us to where we are? If I could just comment, we, we he, he also talks. Where uh, Mr. Okay, if you can hear me, it is not fashionable again to go to school if you can become an overreach. Okay, if you can hear me, Mr. Okay, let we me have, just put this have, in. We have, we have a misplaced national value, and this is what I think we should all be talking about. Okay, uh, let me just come it in is, here and, and just put this in. He talked about some issues, talked about accountability, for example. I, I, I mean, I want us to come off this conversation with a sense of, okay, we have pinpointed the challenges. These are the solutions that are being worked on. These are the ones exactly. that will be worked on. He talked about accountability, which yeah. largely rests with governance. I mean, you have someone who is meant to be in charge of security in a particular area, and you have kidnappings time and again. You have series of killings, and it would seem there's not much repercussion, as it were. So those are some of the challenges he mentioned. But you also bring in the issue of governance. And that might sound vague to some people. You, you talked about uh, governance, prosperity, which might also be vague to some people because prosperity means different things. You, you talked about unemployment. So in terms of governance, let's begin with that and try to be specific. Uh, are you saying that the bulk uh, doesn't just stop at the table of the federal government, so we need to blame state governments and the local governments? Or you're saying that the federal government does not have enough capacity to handle these issues? Just what exactly is that issue with governance? And where is the issue? Thank you. We, we must start. It must be a bottom-top approach. Let's start from uh, municipal administrations. What are local governments doing? What are they doing in terms of stimulating the local economy? Today, what you see all over Nigeria, it's, you know, wanting to, to, to build modern, modern shopping facilities called markets and displacing people without properly relocating them. You must look at the issue of security. These are all you know, issues which we must look at. Nigerians must begin to come out clearly to hold their public officers accountable, not just in terms of you know, physical security, economic security, economic opportunities, Subnational government must come out. This is the only country in the 21st century, unfortunately, that is not taking the issue of education, which is again part of you know developing the human capital. Today, we, we, we make as if we are not concerned. I am a product of public school, and I'm sure my mother is also a product of public school, and so many of us. And the question today is. Why is it no more veritable for the child of the poor man to be properly educated? Now, having gotten an education, what next? To get employed. Not necessarily in the public sector. Government must come with pro-poor policies, with policies that will help the poor. One thing I know very clearly is even if you, if you do not have what to eat, you must leave your house to pursue where to get something to eat. Public transportation is in, coma, is, is in the comatose. So we, we must go back and ask questions. We must, we must begin to, to demand from our governments basic things of life. When the poor man begins to, to, to get opportunities that will make him and his children you know, become somebody, then we'll have started the journey to a nationhood. Well, and that's what I'm saying here. Yeah, Mr. Key, just, just uh, what you, you, the questions that you are asking, um, a good number of people will be wondering, 
we should be asking you those questions because it's your party that is in power. But we'll come to come back to more of that. Uh, let me bring this to uh, Dr. Okupe. Um, you, you spoke about security the other time. Permit me to take a quick trip back there. Because without security, just as you said, um, we're in dire straits. Now, we've been talking about insecurity for so many years now. From Boko Haram to insurgency you talked about earlier, to kidnapping, banditry, all forms of criminality. It raises the question, is it that we don't know what the source of these problems are? Uh, Mr. Oki said the other time that uh, uh, before we can talk about poverty, we have to talk about, uh, before we can talk about security, we have to talk about prosperity. Is it that we don't know the source of all of these problems that have shape shifted over the years? Now, um, can I answer you? Please go ahead, sir. It's your now, name. look, Nigerian security issues can be classified under three major headings. One is the insurgency that, we're current, that is currently rampaging in the Northeast. Second is the issue of banditry that is very, very prevalent in the Northwest. And the third is the issue of the uh, axemen, which you know, uh, has engulfed some other parts of the country, including the Middle Belt and the Southwest, and even some part of the Southeast. So these are the three major issues and once we identify them, they, they require different approaches to, to solving them. The, the former chief of army staff, uh, Burata, uh, General, uh, Major General Buratai, said something and people laughed at him. He said uh, insurgency would take 12 years to solve. Well, you know, I, I don't agree. But, you know, I think the point he was trying to make, which is the truth, is that insurgency takes a hell of a time for it to go. Well, we were in government. I said that based on research and history, you know, there's nowhere in the world that they've gone through insurgency and it has disappeared in two years. The average, age, the average time or tenure or period it takes for you to overcome insurgency is about a minimum of 12 years. The, 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 the IRA in, in Britain took 28 years. The Tamil rebels in, a, in Sri Lanka took about 18 years. I think Yemen was the one that had about maybe seven or, or nine years or something. So, it, and why is it so? Because insurgency is an informal warfare. And most, most countries do not have trained people to cope with informal warfare. Do you understand? So, you know, it is difficult. You know, they, 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 you, there is no battle line drawn anywhere. Go and check the history of battles. You know, usually, I mean, even a long time ago, you know, the one army will stand here, another will stand there, they face each other. All right. But now, these insurgents, they, you know, they have a base. What are the characteristics of insurgents? They usually have a base, I mean, probably very remote, like in our own case, Sambisa. Then they, they have target areas which they attack, you know, infrequently and, you know, with devastation. Then they recruit from the environment. And also, they are, they are, bordered or they are controlled or curtailed or can be curtailed by neighboring countries. So what do we do? We need to reaffirm our arrangements with, you know, with Chad, with uh, Niger, with Cameroon. You know, because if we push, if we push the insurgents, that is, the way, that is where they spill over to. So if we have an agreement with them and we, you know, we work with them, you know, we had a strategy, uh, we had an agreement before, but it has broken down. Is that, that why Shaka was, I mean, has been elusive? It's part of it, you know, because they go in and out of Cameroon or of Chad, you understand? And, you know, Chad is extremely very efficient in curtailing insurgents. You know, I don't know how they do it, but their soldiers seem to be very, very efficient. When they decide, when they became a problem for Chad, you know, Chad moved in very strongly and they stopped them, all right, and drove them back to Sambisa Forest. So, you know, if we know that that is their base, then, you know, like Maduguri, secure Maduguri with whatever it will take the army, secure Maduguri, and from Maduguri, ensure that, you know, po you know the pockets of other places like, you know, Marekanduga and all these places that they go, you have enough military presence to, to drive them back, then attack them at their base. You know, we must be able to overcome 
them at Sambisa Forest. And it's not impossible to do so. All right, let's uh, switch to politics. There's been several conversations in different parts of the country. Well, here's one of such. It's a righteous cause for evil man to, to become president of Nigeria. It will be well deserved. The importance of zoning in Nigeria is as important for Nigeria's own survival as breathing is to human beings. Well, in addition to that, um, let me take this to Mr. Oki. We've heard uh, Governor of Ben State say, look, the current challenge may even impede our preparations or even the 2023 general elections. Then we've seen uh, current governor of Ekiti State also say, look, a certain age, we shouldn't allow anyone above that age vie for any, at least the presidency, has saying we have suffered enough. So do those things have any bearing from your perspective whatsoever? Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, and it's 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 it, it's it's very very, you know, I mean, frightful. Number one, I will take the governor of Benue State. It's speaking the mind of, you know, every Nigerian that is looking at a country where he can truly call his or her country, and uh, without. Peace. I, I don't think we'll be able to do anything. And this will take us back to where I started. You know, he's also talking about, you know, insecurity in his state. Again, for me, the question is, what are you doing in terms of social policies? How well are you trying to, you know, take care of the... You look at insurgency or banditry and you also will need to understand the demography you know of the people involved when you situate that you now begin to look at where we have found ourselves are we even sure that in 2022 we will have a country that can begin to go into thinking about 2023 number one number two Talking about Governor Fayemi's um, uh, um, uh, statement that uh, if you are above 60, you don't have a business. And I'm looking at myself. So it's saying that, you know, for what you are cut off, you should not even think about wanting to be Nigerian president because you are above 60. I, I, I think it's only trying to get at something in terms of, you know, uh, maybe strength, you know, individual strength and the capacity. But the United States of America has a president that is 78, and in the last you know, couple of days, leading to its 100 years in office, he has, you know, shown the world that it is not so much about age. It's not so much about age. It's about what you have to offer. So I, I don't know where it's coming from, but there's a popular saying where I come from, that uh, we, we just tarry a little while. We will see where the masquerade is coming from, and we will see <laughs> okay, who's but... behind the masquerade. <laughs> and that is my response, you know, to that. Okay, because I know that he also knows about this analogy that you've given, but he might have put it in a certain context. But let me bring in Dr. Kukwe on this and get his response as well. What do you think of that, Dr. Kukwe? Uh, well... There are, there are, I think there are three issues. There's uh, the Yohanese uh, president, and then there is the issue of uh, Dr. Uh, Governor Fayami. I've actually issued a statement uh, concerning that uh, statement by Governor Fayami, my very worthy brother. Uh, I also have found out that um, he may not have actually made that statement, but that an aide of his, you know, uh, made the statement. But be that as it may, it's something that cannot stand. It's not sustainable. It's not democratic. It is also unconstitutional. The Nigerian constitution does not stop anybody uh, below or above certain age from taking part in, you know, in the uh, electoral process. So I don't think that is sustainable and it's not something we should really waste our time on. But um, also, the issue raised by the governor of Benue, 
is very, very germane. You know, the way things are, and unless we get, that's why I'm a bit emotional about these issues of security. You know, unless we get, we get on top of them, they will disrupt our plans and our programs. And it will be unfortunate, you know, because, you know, how many shocks that can a country, you know, in, a la you know, in the lifetime of a, of a generation, how many shocks can it absorb and survive? So, you know, it's better if, you know, if there's a possibility that if things keep going on like this, you know, they, they, they may not be a, a country to call your own for, for you to even hold, hold an election. Do you know, I mean, you remember that during, I mean, as some time passed, elections were postponed because certain areas could not take part in them. So if the, if the scape, if the landscape becomes enlarged and it takes over over half of the country, you know, how can we be talking about the election? Then lastly, the issue about the uh, statement from the president of, of Oranese. Personally, I have, I have taken a decision that I will never ever in public discuss anything to do with presidency and politics and Igbo people. I've, I've taken that decision, and that was because of a statement I made, you know, which I, when I thought I was speaking the truth, and I was totally, completely uh, uh, bashed and uh, beaten, you know, uh, unfortunately. But be that as it may, truth must, also be, must always be told. None of us, you see, Nigeria is the Nigerian constitution and the Nigerian uh, you know, uh, ge geopolitics is killed and it is not okay. But it is the constitution and it is the country. And unless you change it, certain things cannot change. I'm going to shock you this morning by telling you something. You know that the North can actually become president. A presidential candidate from the North can become president without any substantial support from the, from the South. And it is constitutional. And I will tell you how. I will tell you how. Because if you go for an election, all right, and a Northern candidate is backed by majority of people in the North, and because of the number, he will have the numerical, the numerical uh, 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 advantage, you know, superiority, but he will not have the two-thirds majority. So what does the Constitution say? The Constitution says you will now go for a runoff with, with the person who came second, and then at, at that point in time, it is simple majority. So again, the man will win simple majority. So tell me. <laughs> so you know, these are issues. That's number one issue. Second issue is that, you know, uh, there's no, there are, six, there are six, six zones in the country. Apart from the north, no zone, including southwest, south, south, southeast, can present a candidate, and the candidate will win unless there is a national consensus, an evolution of a national consensus. What is a national consensus? A national consensus is where a majority of the zones of the country have taken a decision that the presidency shall come from this area, just like it happened in 1999. In 1999, for whatever reasons, especially I mean, because of the death of Abiola, many people in the country felt that the, the universe had been shortchanged. Short and that there was a need to assuage the, 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 the raw nerves of people in the Southwest. And it was done in such a way, it was, this was also sponsored by the North. It was done, in, and they are the only people who have that kind of capacity. In this, our present uh, uh, arrangement we have, it was done in such a way that only two, I mean, the two candidates that emerged for election were Yoruba people, Fadaye and Obasanjo. So head or tail, the Yoruba to become president. So the issue is this. You know, if any region, if any zone wants to present a presidential candidate and sincerely wants that candidate to win, then you must find a process. You must develop a process. You must create a process. You must engineer a process by which a national consensus can evolve. That's I know. I know part of the reason why the law didn't want one region to produce a president without the input from other regions, then that's why they talked about the spread, that they must have spread in yeah, other I'm parts. Sorry. I'm just trying to show you how it can be subverted. Okay. Well, let, let's uh, get Mr. Oki as we wind down on this one. Well, Mr. Oki, if you can make this in less than 60 seconds, I think that would be great. So tell us now. In the light of what is playing out, of course, I know you heard this before. Why would anyone want to vote the APC? The, the Go ahead. Yes, Dr. Cooper has took the honestness and the, the truth be told. 
But uh, you see, in electoral um, uh, politics and the uh, um, uh, competition, you will always have those that I call, uh, you know, pretenders, you know, contenders, contestants, and aspirants. And unless the South, you know, comes together, what played out in '93, in 1999, will play out in 2022, not 2023. And this is the reason why today. If we go to you know any competition, APC seems to be the destination of choice. Because in the land today, there is truly no opposition. What we have today in Nigeria, it's individual people, you know, having you know a different or diverging view from what they think the, 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 the government is doing. And the party is not doing anything you know, in terms of opposition. And uh, for us to look at the next round of competition and think there really will be competition, it's really not going to be so. APC will continue to be the party of choice. Not that APC has done spectacularly well, but because indeed there is no opposition in the land. And that's my take. All right, Mr. Fouad Oki, uh, APC stakeholder, and Dr. Doni Okupe, former presidential spokesperson. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today on the program. All right, that is how far we can go today. We do thank you all for your comments, which unfortunately we were not able to take them. Apologies, but we'll see you again tomorrow. I'm Chamberlain. What's up? I'm Kyoto Okikiro. And I'm Ayo Makine. Do stay safe.